Uh, welcome. I'm Bruce Gewertz, uh, Surgeon in Chief at Cedar Sinai, and it's my great pleasure to have today uh, Dr. P.K. Shaw, one of our internationally known uh, cardiologists. P.K., thank you for coming today. Thank you, Bruce, for inviting me. Uh, tell us a bit about your background. Where did you grow up and go to school and train? Well, I was born and raised in Kashmir, North India, where I went to college and medical school. And after that, I spent a year at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And from there, I went to Wisconsin to do a residency, and then to New York at Albert Einstein to do more residency and cardiology fellowship before landing up at Cedar sinai as a research fellow in 1976. How did you become interested in cardiology in general? Well, it was my original intent was to become a neurologist. And in fact, I was offered a residency at Johns Hopkins to do neurology training. But before that happened, uh, the chief of medicine and chief of cardiology at Einstein Montefiore Hospital gave cardiology grand rounds while I was a resident. And after listening to that grand rounds, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a cardiologist. So I called Hopkins and said, I'm not coming. I've changed my specialty. And I applied for cardiology fellowship and stayed on there to do my training. Well, it was definitely our great good fortune. Uh, how did you initially get interested in coronary artery disease as your focus? Uh, after coming to Cedar sinai I finished my research fellowship, joined the CCU staff, and eventually became the director of the CCU in 19... I suppose it was 1980. And during that time, I was struck by the fact that we were seeing all these patients coming in with heart attacks, cardiogenic shock, unstable angina, and by the dozens. And many of them were not even making it out of the CCU. And I began to say, what, what, what is it that we are doing to prevent these things from happening? We didn't have a great understanding of the underlying disease process of atherosclerosis at that time. So I became very interested in studying atherosclerosis. And over the years, took a year of sabbatical at Mass General Hospital, learned vascular biology, came back, and set up a research program called the Atherosclerosis Research Center, began focusing on the basic biology of atherosclerosis, and began to apply those principles to the management of patients in the coronary care unit. And we're going to talk some more about your particular research studies in atherosclerosis because they're really very exciting. But perhaps you could just review what the principal drivers of atherosclerotic plaque, particularly in the coronary distribution, are. The basic mechanism of atherosclerosis really involves the entry of lipoproteins, which are lipid-carrying particles in the circulating blood and they become trapped in the arterial wall. And once they become trapped, they get oxidized and induce an inflammatory and immune response. And that perpetuates the buildup of further cholesterol within the arterial wall, and eventually a plaque forms. And this plaque, under the influence of inflammation, can burst. And when it bursts, it triggers a blood clot, which can shut off blood flow to that artery. And that shutting of a blood flow can trigger an arrhythmia and sudden death, or can trigger a heart attack if you survive it. And so the fundamental reason for atherosclerosis is the entry and retention of atherogenic lipoproteins within the arterial wall. So high levels of cholesterol are conducive to that, and that's a major initiator of atherosclerosis. But inflammation subsequent to that plays an important perpetuating role. Yes, I, as vascular surgeon, uh, it always uh, was surprising to me the variation on the degree of inflammation. Uh, and it seemed that some patients had quite a bit of scarring around their arteries elsewhere in the body where I operate on them. Other patients have less. So to, to turn that around to your specific disease, are there strong genetic uh, predispositions to atherosclerosis? Yes, there are powerful genetic underpinnings for atherosclerotic process, to some extent mediated through lipoprotein levels, but sometimes also independent of lipoprotein levels, where the inflammatory genes may be involved. And those inflammatory genes are independent 
of lipoprotein levels. So you have lipid-related genetic predisposition and non-lipid-related genetic predisposition. So you're right, genetic underpinnings play an important modifying role. Uh, tell me about the uh, effect of diet, a diet high in fat versus a diet uh, that would be uh, more uh, heart healthy. It used to be thought rather simplistically that high fat intake is conducive to atherosclerosis. Over the last nearly three decades, we have learned that it's not fat, it's the type of fat that's more important. For example, if you have saturated fat or trans fat that's more conducive to buildup of atherosclerosis than a diet that contains mono or polyunsaturated fats such as avocado, olive oil, they, or fish fat, they tend to be relatively protective against atherosclerosis. So what I tell my patients is not low fat diet, but right fat diet is the way to contain this condition. And the fish oil and other things are more of a, what we would call a Mediterranean-style diet. Is that right? Correct. There are many different diet programs that have been recommended, but the one diet for which we have the most persuasive scientific data is the Mediterranean diet. Good for the heart, good for the brain, and good for cancer risk reduction. And relevant to your previous comments, I, I assume as well that certain dietary indiscretions would be worse in people who are genetically predisposed to plaque formation and potentially less harmful to people that are not? Yes, obviously different people may react differently to their dietary intake. And a very fascinating observation recently is that the gut bacteria have an important role to play. For example, if you eat a lot of meat and you have certain type of gut bacteria, you generate proatherogenic and pro-inflammatory molecules that accelerate atherosclerosis. But if you don't have those bacteria, you could potentially eat meat and not have the adverse consequences because the second part, the bacterial products, are not there. And that bacterial gut microbiome is to some extent genetically regulated, but also subject to environmental influences. And that might account for why the incidence of coronary artery disease is different in different parts of the world? That's part of the reason, absolutely. Uh, what about smoking and other behavioral things? How much of an impact does that really have on atherosclerosis? Lifestyle factors other than lipids make a big difference. For example, diabetes or prediabetes, insulin resistance, cigarette smoking or recreational drug use, cocaine, amphetamine, and so forth. All of those are very, very conducive to plaque rupture and thrombosis and acceleration of coronary artery disease. Smoking being one of the worst, you can have minimal amount of plaque, but you smoke a lot, it creates a pro-thrombotic milieu in the blood. So even a slight disruption of the plaque may create a huge thrombotic consequence because you're a smoker. So smoking is deadly. So I understand that, that the rate of uh, heart attacks or myocardial infarctions in our emergency room here at Cedar sinai like around the rest of the country, has dramatically reduced over the last 15 years. How would you account for that? I think to a large extent the decline in coronary heart disease-related mortality and heart attack and stroke risk has declined over the last three decades due to preventive interventions, which is more consciousness about heart-healthy diet, use of statins to lower high cholesterol, use of baby aspirin to prevent thrombosis, better control of diabetes and blood pressure. All of these factors that control all the risk factors have contributed to a decline in cardiovascular mortality in the last three decades. And, and everybody uh, that I know is on, uh, always asking me whether they should be on statins and aspirin are they wonder drugs that everyone should be on? Well, I don't think we're quite there yet to say that everybody should be on a statin. In, in other words, it's not time to put statin in your drinking water because there are people who will benefit are mostly those at high risk. Those individuals at low risk are who, have not, who are not forming plaque in their arteries are less likely to benefit. So I think it has to be individualized. Higher the baseline risk, greater the potential benefit from a statin. 
And, and the benefits of statin that you outlined have to do with lipid handling, uh, but don't they have other effects on stabilizing plaques? Yes, but the benefit of statins is through lowering of LDL cholesterol, but that in itself then changes the plaque composition and stabilizes it by activating a secondary anti-inflammatory response. So you're right, statins have multiple effects, but the basic effect is lowering LDL cholesterol, which then leads to an array of other protective effects. So should everyone at some certain age have some type of screening test for coronary artery disease? That's an excellent question. And uh, I've spent nearly 15 to 20 years of my life in uh, uh, promoting screening for subclinical atherosclerosis. Because atherosclerosis can build up for years before it causes symptoms or a heart attack. So we fortunately now are able to identify atherosclerosis in the carotid artery using ultrasound, which is totally non-invasive and relatively inexpensive, or in the case of the heart, looking at coronary calcium score using a non-contrast CT, and in some cases with contrast, we can also identify the degree of narrowing. And these tests are now routinely available and make a dramatic difference because patients who don't want to take a statin or don't want to take uh, healthy measures want to, want to know, do I have plaque in my arteries? And if they don't have plaque, you can go easy on statins. If you do have plaque, I think they get religion and they quickly accept the medical treatment that's advised. So it makes a big difference. So we all hear these tragic stories of perfectly healthy young people who go off and play basketball at age 35 and, and have a heart attack that may actually result in a mortality. How do you determine at what age people should have these screening tests? Yeah, the imaging tests that utilize radiation, for example, the CT scan, in general, we recommend it for men over 50, women over 55, but that age limit can be reduced if there's strong family history of premature heart disease you can start screening at 30 or even 40 years of age. I think all of these things would become less important if we emphasize to our children how to adopt a heart-healthy lifestyle from teenage years. Because the disease process can be completely averted if you begin preventive measures from childhood on. Yeah, I think one of the most important lessons we're learning is that the earlier you initiate preventive measures, the more bang you get for the buck subsequently. And focusing on children and young adults, making sure they don't smoke, making sure they're not overweight, making sure they eat a whole healthy diet and modest, moderate degree of exercise can prevent the epidemic of this disease 20, 30, 40 years later. So I think that's a very important lesson to learn is focus on early age in, in uh, that'll deal the greatest benefit in terms of subsequent risk of heart disease. Well, PK, you and I uh, have had the great good fortune of sharing many meals together, and at some of those meals, wine is served. I can't help but ask you, what's the right answer? Does one or two glasses of wine hurt or help uh, heart disease? I mean, my advice to patients is, in general, if you enjoy a glass of wine, one at the most two glasses of wine a day is acceptable little bit less for women, maybe half to one glass. But beyond that, you begin to incur the adverse consequences of alcohol. So I think if you enjoy wine, go ahead and have a glass of wine today. Do I want a glass of red or a glass of white? Most studies suggest that it doesn't matter what color the wine is, it's the alcohol stupid. But there are some, like the French, who believe it's the red wine. That's better. That's better, Yeah. right. So I know that your research, which has been pathbreaking and, and widely recognized uh, nationally and internationally, has been focused on generating drugs and vaccines to prevent the progression of atherosclerotic plaques. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, it turns out that <clears throat> when cholesterol gets deposited in the arterial wall, it stimulates the immune response from the body. And the initial attempt by the immune system is to try to get the cholesterol out of the plaque and so protect the artery. But it's like uh, the immune cells come in, they start 
taking up the cholesterol, and initially they are successful in driving it out of the arterial wall. But at some point they become paralyzed, and they cannot get out of the plaque, and they actually start producing chemicals and antibodies that perpetuate inflammation in the arterial wall. So the immune system can have a beneficial role or an adverse role in perpetuating atherosclerosis. And we began to actually identify antigens that can provoke a protective immune response. And these antigens are based on the protein part of LDL cholesterol particle. And we've shown that some of these antigens, when used as vaccines, can reduce the degree of plaque inflammation and plaque buildup in experimental models. And we are currently trying to optimize the formulation of this vaccine so that it could be tested in humans. And similarly, we have generated a monoclonal antibody against some of the oxidized lipid-related antigens that in animal models induces rapid regression. And we, are, we have done a phase one and a phase two A study in humans, and we are planning for a phase two study this year sometime towards the middle or later part of this year. And that will test the idea that giving an antibody against oxidized LDL epitope actually induces regression of atherosclerosis. It'll be very exciting to see if that concept pans out. And, uh, you know, uh, to your point that you made earlier, over the last 30 years, there's been a uh, very persistent downward trend in the complications of coronary artery disease. Uh, do, you do you see that continuing, or is it leveled off? I think to some extent the, the <clears throat> it's leveled off in the last few years because of increased epidemic of obesity and diabetes, and that kind of takes away some of the gains we have made prior to that, and that's a worry right now that continuing diabetes type of epidemic may negate all the benefits if we're not careful about containing this epidemic of diabetes and obesity. And as well, here at Cedars-Sinai, where we have one of the world's largest heart transplant programs, it, it would suggest that there has been a general shift from the presentation of the disease from heart attacks to more heart failure. Have you seen that in your practice? Yes, heart failure has become a major public health problem and crisis because now we're keeping people alive from heart attack and they begin to develop other forms of heart disease such as congestive heart failure. And that is a very challenging condition because we don't have, although we have some effective medications, but at some point end stage heart failure, you have to treat either with a transplant or an artificial heart type of procedure. And that's a tremendous drain on healthcare resources. So preventing heart failure is also a public health priority. And one way to do that is to reduce the number of heart attacks. Another way is to get a better understanding of non-heart attack related heart congestive heart failure. And one particular subtype of heart failure that's defied full understanding is what we call as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. Where the problem is not the pumping efficiency of the heart, but it's the ability to relax is impaired, and that causes congestive heart failure. We haven't quite figured out what the best way to treat that particular form of heart failure, and it's almost half of all heart failures are heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. No, that's remarkable. And, and I would imagine that your point about diabetes and obesity is unquestioned if you look across the country. And I would also imagine uh, that the aging population uh, means that heart failure and heart disease is never going to be gone uh, and is something that we really need to continue to focus on. Your point is well taken. In spite of all the progress and the decline, heart disease is still the number one killer of men and women in the U.S. and much of the developing world. And if anybody tells you things go well as you get older, don't believe them. Nothing good happens as you get old all kinds of problems begin to surface. <laughs> well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank you for being with us here today, and uh, please keep up your path-breaking work. Thank you very much, Bruce, for giving me this opportunity.